Along with climate change, this pollution is adding a lot of pressure. A third of the fishing currently that occurs is considered unsustainable. So the microalgae have been shown to produce other interesting molecules. The approach for using microalgae in space flight and in the future is quite open and would be applicable. And we control the pH, the environment, the temperature, the humidity. And the original idea was the microalgae would be able to generate food and nutrition for the astronauts on their space flight and also generate oxygen. Hi, my name is Ross Zirkel, and I'm a microbiologist. I work for DSM Furminish, and I've been a scientist for DSM Furminish for 20 years, and my role is to develop microalgae for the production lipids. Well, generally, I think it's quite serious. Along with climate change, this pollution is adding a lot of pressure to the ecosystem and the marine environments. Absolutely, there's a lot of pressure that's applied both by glo global warming and by overfishing. A third of the fishing currently that occurs is considered unsustainable. And along with this, sometimes with the fishing boats and the different materials they use, these also can be left behind in the ocean and contribute to pollution. And all these have a giant impact on the marine ecosystem. And additionally, in the future, there's actually things like microplastics that might become more and more prevalent as we learn new facts. I think it's been shown pretty conclusively by the WHO and other uh, international bodies that overfishing is quite a serious issue at this point. And I think the current data points to a third of the fishing that currently occurs is considered unsustainable sustainable and can't go forward. And these uh, dwindling stocks and dwindling supplies are quite serious. Actually, fish that are grown in aquaculture and not fed omega-3s are devoid and, and contain no omega-3s. And fish mostly accumulate omega-3s from their diet. These are from microalgae and other microscopic organisms in the environment. And they eat these and then accumulate the omega-3s. So the research we've done specifically on some microalgae that are able to produce these omega-3s. And we consider these the original source of omega-3s in the marine ecosystem. And in a way, if we use these microalgae to produce the omega-3s, we cut out the middleman or the fish. So microalgae are algae, but very small, so you need a microscope to observe them. And these are mostly photosynthetic, but there are also some versions that are non-photosynthetic, and they can be found in freshwater or in marine environments. And they're unicellular, so one cell, and they can be found in clumps or chains. And the estimates are there's between half a million and a million microalgal species, and right now only about one to two percent of those have been described by scientists. And so there's great diversity and we think opportunity to use these microalgae. So the microalgae have been shown to produce other interesting molecules and these include things like carotenoids and other flavors, biofuel, and also been able to demonstrate to be used in bioremediation. The microalgae can be used also for whole cell nutrients. So these could include amino acids and proteins and other carbohydrates. They can produce on a very, very large scale. We start with with a single colony, but then these grow in larger and larger scale, up to 200 or 300,000 liter fermentations. That's right, this is uh, one of the uh, microalgae considered the bottom of the pyramid and really supply the omega-3s and other nutrients until the, into the entire marine environment. Since we isolate single cells and then they're grown inside a laboratory and fermentation and industrialized process, we control the inputs, how they're grown, and the conditions to assure there's no contaminants or no leftover pollution from the Ocean. The, uh, the process is industrialized fermentation in which we start with a small amount of cells and grow these to larger and larger densities and we control the conditions they're grown in. So this way when we feed sugar a certain way, control the pH or the carbon dioxide, the performance changes and we sort of train them to grow in a way we want and make production of fatty acids in the way we want. That's why we have come to develop Life's DHA and EPA for DSM Furminish. I think it's important since it's a sustainable source of nutrients and omega I think it has zero impact on the marine environment and it's consistable, reliant, and robust. Right now also sometimes fish oil products can take up to 15 months from the catch until it makes it to a dietary supplement and that supply chain sometimes can have low resilience and in this way production of microalgae is much more robust and controlled. Absolutely I do think there's microalgae that have the potential to do that. Once again microalgae are able to make proteins and amino acids and carbohydrates and a lot of the nutrients that people in 
different animals need. And so a lot of opportunity. So the omega-3s can be found in a lot of different forms. This includes oils that are going to dietary supplements or can be powders that go into infant formulas. But this is another expertise of DSM Firminish, able to formulate in lots of different ways to go into milks or gummies or powders. And a lot of technology is important to make sure that that product's delivered in just the right way. So there's lots and lots of different microalgae, so it's hard to say exactly what they taste like. But generally, some of these that we've been able to taste that are safe to taste have this kind of salty umami taste and sometimes like a fresh ocean feel to it. And some folks like the taste of this, other folks not so much. <laughs> A lot of times we isolate the products out, so often we're not eating the entire microalgae itself. But once again, I think it's a, a fine taste. So I know a little less about exactly how those nutrients are supplied for outer space and astronauts. As mentioned, um, the history with microalgae and MarTech, that was the original idea. And I think it continues to be a concept that NASA and other folks take a look at with microalgae being for the supply, but the exact details I'm not sure of. So the history of Life's DHA and Life's Omega goes back to the early 1980s. And there was a small startup company called MarTech that had a contract with NASA to try to investigate microalgae for space. Flight. And the original idea was the microalgae would be able to generate food and nutrition for the astronauts on their space flight and also generate oxygen. And the original scientists and founders also wanted to see what other nutritional values the microalgae could have, and they stumbled upon the omega-3s being enriched in certain microalgae. And so these original strains of microalgae were able to produce DHA and generated the product called Life's DHA and became very, very important in infant nutrition. And then using that expertise, DSM Firminish has been able to find and additional microalgae that make both EPA and DHA and important for the product called Life's Omega. And this is a true fish oil replacement generated by microalgae. Very generally, EPA and DHA are considered essential fatty acids. And the studies have shown that DHA is very important in brain and eye health and cognition. And then EPA is really important in heart health and inflammation. And there's been decades and decades of studies with fish oil and fish oil contains both EPA and DHA. And so to capture all those benefits, you really need both EPA and DHA to supply the benefits that fish oil has shown to be historically important to do. Yes, the product's been shown to be safe and effective. There's global regulatory systems that we do lots of studies uh, to make sure it's safe and effective for, for all ages. And in fact, for infants, the standards are even higher. There's more various types of tests that need to be uh, carried out to show it's uh, safe and effective for infants. We're very proud of our organism database that we have. Right now, we have over 6,000 microbes that have been collected in our strain collection. And over half of these are microalgae specifically for making omega-3s. And it's a real specialty of our company to go out and collect and find and encourage the correct microalgae to grow. And in fact, as a scientist, it's really one of the most fun things you get to do to go out and collect these and dig in the sand and look in the water and collect and bring these back into the lab. It's very exciting. That's right, the Space Foundation recognizes companies and technology that impacts human life. And so the Life's brand has been recognized by both the certification and also the Space Technology Hall of Fame as products that came out of NASA and space research specifically and then entered the human market here on Earth. I believe so. I think generally the approach for using microalgae in space flight and in the future is quite open and would be applicable. I do think it's quite challenging in these hostile environments and there are scientific agencies and teams out there looking at this and it is a promising technology. So the conditions are highly controlled and we start with a sterile environment and then work in an aseptic technique to be able to transfer and grow the organisms. And as they're growing, we monitor them quite closely that their performance matches what's expected. And we control the pH, the environment, the temperature, the humidity to make sure the growth is appropriate and growing how we expect it. And we monitor quite closely for any contamination. And if the contamination occurs, we need to stop the fermentation and throw that batch away. So once again, highly controlled, to high quality. Quality. So we continue to take a look at how the microalgae perform and we investigate ways to reduce carbon footprint of the production. And one way is our innovations are really geared to making higher, higher levels of EPA and DHA in the microalgae. And the other way is we have early research feeding waste streams and carbon that comes from other industries into our fermentations to even improve the life cycle and carbon footprint more. And these uh, improvements in the carbon footprint are the number one innovation project that uh, we work on as technologists right now.
It was very exciting to be able to share uh, some of the life's work and technology that uh, myself and the team worked on very hard over the years. And as a scientist, you work many, many years and many experiments, and often many of them fail. And so the fact that we were able to develop these strains of microalgae to make a product that's so important and made such an impact makes us very happy and proud. And the, the number one thing we're going to do going forward is to continue to improve the carbon footprint and aim for a carbon neutral process in the future. And that, that really drives drives us um, and gets us to work every day and gets us excited and, and really looking forward to next time talking about that technology. To start, I was very nervous, but uh, the team here made it uh, very comfortable, very good questions, warmed up after a while. It was incredible, really enjoyable, and uh, thank you very, very much.